just going to be a brief introduction. I'd like to uh, welcome everybody to the science behind climate solutions. Uh, we have one more of these next month. Laura Gurdon, uh, Professor Gurdon, has been kind enough to set these digital series and invite experts from all over to help contribute to our understanding and discussion of the issue of climate change. I'm actually joining you from Lancaster, Pennsylvania. I believe Laura is in Media, Pennsylvania. Alex, our presenter, is, is from the West Coast. I don't know exactly where on the West Coast, but you know he's in a different time zone. And then Shaban is, I believe, uh, at the main campus, Penn State, right? Is that correct? Yeah, near awesome. State College. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, I'd just like to welcome both of you, and thank you for coming to help uh, present and understand these issues more. So with that, I'll turn it over to Laura. Fantastic. And again, welcome everyone to our latest installment of the what we initially called Drawdown DCIS series. And we're still getting some questions from people. What is Drawdown and what does it mean? So let me go ahead and share my screen briefly just to give you a, a, a introduction for some of you, or maybe it's a reminder for others too of what is Project Drawdown. So Project Drawdown is an international organization. It is a nonprofit uh, that works towards what we call drawdown solutions. And what is a drawdown solution? The idea, as you can see here, our mission is to help the world reach drawdown, the point in the future when the levels of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, they stop climbing and steadily decline which is going to get us away from some of the impacts that we're uh, seeing from climate change. And the idea is to, to lower those gases quickly, safely, and equitably as possible. So you can go to drawdown.org. Within Drawdown, there are several different sectors and solutions that exist there. We've already had our discussion on electricity that was last month's. And again, that is available uh, as a recording for you to, to access from the DCIS website. We are focusing this month on food, agriculture, and land use sector, and next month will be the industry sector. And on the page on Drawdown, you can see so much information about the ideas of what we can do, what are our good practices that we can engage in to reach that Drawdown point. I'm going to quickly scroll just so you can see uh, and I can't really fit them all in here, but you can see some, we're only gonna hear a very small portion of what can be done to address this as you go through, but you can see eating more plant-rich diets, improving rice production, reducing our food waste. Uh, some of these you've probably heard and some of these ideas or solutions may be new to you, but what's wonderful about the Drawdown Project, it is all research-based, this is data-driven, uh, and it's, it's an incredible effort uh, that is across science, it's across policy, thinking about what are ways where we can actually reach, again, that drawdown that we're aiming for. So tonight, I am so excited to introduce to you. We have two speakers that are joining us for this panel tonight. We have Siobhan Patel, who is an assistant teaching professor of agricultural and biological engineering from Penn State University and State College. Her areas of expertise include the study of sediment transport, eco-hydrology, mathematical modeling. Um, and today she's also going to be uh, contributing a little bit about farm energy and biogas. And, uh, and she will be having the Pennsylvania focus. Uh, but we will start with something with a little bigger focus. So we have Alex Martinez here, who is a PhD candidate at the University of California in Irvine. He's in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering. His primary research interest is linking natural disasters to social impacts. He is currently a member of the Voices for Science program with the American Geophysical Union, and in 2020 was named one of the new faces of civil engineering by the American Society of Civil Engineers. So we'll start with Alex giving a short overview and presentation of some of the exciting research uh, and topics he's been working on. Then we'll switch over to Siobhan uh, to give her presentation. Then we'll start a discussion across our panelists. And then at any point during today, please do go into the chat and post your questions. We will be getting to your chat uh, chat questions as we get towards the end today. So Alex, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Laura. All right, so good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Alex Martinez. As I say, I'm from the University of California, Irvine, a PhD candidate. And today I will talk about some of my research at UC Irvine. But first about me, uh, I'm originally from France. I got my master's degree from Ecole Centrale in Lille, which is one hour north of Paris. Then I went to Texas to get my master's degree in water resources engineering from UT Austin. 
Uh, then I moved with my advisor to Lubbock in West Texas. I didn't really like it, so I went to California then uh, to study my PhD at UC Irvine in civil engineering, but with a focus on earth system science and data science. And what I do is that I work on using geometry sense data for characterizing vegetation with a big uh, focus on crop. And also on the side, I work on using virtual reality for climate change scenario representation. And so what I did for this was to create virtual reality experience for coastal flooding uh, visualization under different climate change uh, scenario. But back uh, to the food. So as you probably know, in the past centuries, we have the number of famines are drastically decreased. We used to have 10 to 20 million people dying every decade uh, in the past century but this number is really low now. Uh, on the other hand, the undernourishment rate also decreased a lot, but it's stable now to roughly 10% uh, in, within the past 10 years. And the reason of this are numerous, there is less war, there are strong improvement of farming practice, more machineries, more fertilizing, and access to irrigation. And also we have a better access to trade, which I will develop in this presentation. So uh, countries always trade food. Uh, for instance, is what we learned in history. US sent a lot of sheep with wheat uh, to France in 1789 when we had a very bad harvest. And still now, when the country has a bad harvest, they can still import food from other countries. So trade can act as a buffer against local food prices. But if you look at the evolution of uh, the trade network between countries within the past decades, what we see is that we have a concentration of trade towards cereals and the consolidation of few major producers on the global uh, trade network. Uh, what we can see on the right uh, plot is a share of wheat, maize, rice, and barley on the total calories and protein uh, trade between countries. So for instance, in 2000, wheat was about 16% of the total calories trade, and this number went to 26% uh, 26 in 2010. And roughly wheat, maize, rice, and barley represents more than half of the calories and protein trade between the countries. If we look at where they're coming from, we see that US, Canada uh, are two major produce exporters for the Middle East and also for Central and Southern America. And so what we have is this consolidation of the few major uh, producers and cereal that is exposing countries to produce production shocks happening on other parts of the trade network. So let's say if you have one extreme event in USA, a drought happening in USA, you will get stress on agriculture, so loss of revenues for farmers. You will get some water restriction. Uh, today in California, the snowpack was 0%, which is two months earlier than usual, and the city of uh, the Santa Clara County, where the Silicon Valley is, uh, got its water allocation cut by 25% because of the drought condition. And uh, we are also low level on reservoirs, so less recreational activities. But what we never see in USA is a food shortage. If there is a pandemic, people might rush to buy all the food they can, but if there's a drought or heat wave, they will not do much. Uh, but as I said before, US export a lot of food to many countries in the world and they can have some impact. Uh, I will show here two examples of uh, local food shortage due to extreme events. And the bottom one is in Algeria when there was a drought in Russia, Russia put some ban exportation and Algeria got much less sweet than usual that resulted in uh, less bread availability, as you can see on the picture. Uh, on the top one, it's a butter shortage in France in 2012 during the heat wave and the coal was stressed so less milk was produced and there was a short, so people rushed to the store to buy all the butter they could and there was a butter shortage in France. And in two cases, people were unhappy and they protest and that's how extreme event can lead to some social unrest. So the question is, how can we link these events? If you look at food security, on the left we have uh, for calories, on the right for proteins. So these plots basically tell you the diversity of diet and uh, food supplier for every country. On the horizontal axis, we have diet diversity. If you're more toward the right, uh, like you can see the Bermuda, you can, it means you eat calories from different sources of food. If you're more to the left, it means you eat mainly one type of food and a few of the others. And on the vertical axis is supplier diversity. So it means if you're on the top, that you import food equally from a little bit every country. And if you're on the bottom, 
like Mexico here, for instance, it means you import a lot of food only from one country and the rest from other countries. Uh, Mexico import a lot of food from the USA, so it makes sense they have a, a low supplier diversity score. And as I said before, because the globalization of the food system, people can, countries can be exposed to production shock happening at the other side of the trade network. So basically all, all countries with, with a low supplier diversity might be exposed to production shock happening uh, in another country. And if we look uh, if this production shock can happen, they can actually happen quite often. On the left side, what we have is the wheat production for the food world. And if we look at the first top countries, China, India, US, Russia, and France, all together contribute to 50% of the total production of wheat in the world, which is a lot. Uh, the bar and the colors will represent the number of events where the yield was low, lower than usual. In uh, yellow, it was five to 10% lower than usual. In uh, orange, 10 to 20, and in red, 20 to less, percent than, less than usual. And what we can see is that most of the countries have a lot of wet, so a lot of yield at least 20% less than the norm, which is a lot, uh, even the major producer. China, India don't export a lot of food, but they consume a lot. So if they have a production less than usual, they will import a lot and disrupt the trade network. For Russia, US and France, it's the opposite. They export a lot. If they produce less, they will export less, so also disrupt the trade network. But the trade network can also be disrupted in other ways. Uh, we all probably remember the Suez Canal a couple of weeks ago. If we look at corn export from the USA, 80% of it transits from the Midwest to the Gulf of Mexico by the Mississippi River. So if you ask a farmer in Iowa if he should be worried about flooding in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, the answer is yes, he should be worried because if Baton Rouge is flooded, the ship will not be able to move the corn from the Midwest to the Gulf of Mexico. And you will have to pay some alternative, which for instance is diesel truck, which is really expensive, especially if the demand is high and extremely polluting. Uh, he has also the option, it's what they did two years ago to store all the food on the land. But when you store uh, harvest on the land, it is usually not insured. And if you have some flooding happening on it, you will lose all your harvest and revenues. So these are some examples the train network can be disrupted. And another one is if you have a change of planted area. So this is another project I work on is using satellite imagery and machine learning. Uh, the satellite we use, the main one is Sentinel-1 that gives you an idea of how much water you have per pixel. It's 20 meter resolution and using other satellite and machine learning technique, we were able to map the rice paddies in Bangladesh and also in India. India. And it can have a lot of applications, for instance, to monitor uh, the total area for the production of methane emission. And what we saw is that for different districts, we have a decrease of area in 2019 and 20 that are due for different reasons. Uh, we know that in some area, farmers are switching from rice to cotton or corn that are more that are higher value crops and will be more drought resistant, but it can be any other type of event as well, such as a shortage of labor due to some restriction or other things. So now back to um, the main work. So the idea is to be able to link one extreme event happening in one country, a major food producer to other countries. So for every event, what we do is to characterize the event and then look at the change in crop yield and also in harvest area using different um, satellite products. And then we have a loss of production. And from this production loss, we use a trend model to be able to convert it to a change of food supply in every country. And then we convert the change of food supply into a change of nutrition supply, which is calories, proteins, et cetera, to have some final, final indicator. Uh, here's an example that we have from the 2002-3 North American drought, uh, US and Canada on Venezuela food supply. And what we see is that during the drought and after it, the food supply of Venezuela, the calorie supply of Venezuela decreased, but also if we look at where the calories were coming from, protein, fab, or carb, we see that the protein content decreased and the share of fat increased. So what happened is that with less wheat importing from USA, maybe they switched to other commodities, such as beans that are higher fat value. 
And we have here a few more examples. I will provide my email at the end. And uh, if you want any more information, feel free to contact me. And one major um, thing as well is when we convert food to nutrition, we know that, uh, for instance, wheat have a different content, protein content depending on the region it is grown, the growing condition, the years. So what we did also for this work at UCI is that we tried to estimate the, con the quality of the food produced in the nutritional values by focusing on proteins. So what we did is use different satellite products during the grain feeding phase of the wheat uh, to be able to assess the protein content of the food. And then we are able to add it in our algorithm to calculate the change of protein supply for every country due to one event happening in the major food producer. And that's all uh, for the presentation. Here is my email and website if you have any questions. Thank you so much for that, Alex. I have so many questions already myself, but <laughs> we're gonna save those up for now. And again, if anyone has any questions themselves, please do put that in the chat. We are gonna go ahead and turn it over to Siobhan, uh, who's gonna bring it down to Pennsylvania and, uh, and we'll hear a little bit about her work. So Siobhan, it's all yours. Thanks, Laura. Okay, let me share my screen with you. Are you seeing that okay? Yes, we are. Thank you. Okay. So as Laura said, my name's Siobhan Fattel, and I thought I'd talk, take a little bit of a different approach and talk about farms and energy and irrigation efficiency and how they all relate to this, this topic of project drawdown. But first, let me tell you a little bit about myself. I am an assistant teaching professor at, in the Ag and Engineering Department biological engineering department at Penn State at State College. And outside of teaching some classes in energy systems and science communication, I also am part of my appointment is through the extension. So that means I work with community and do a outreach and it particularly in the, the area of renewable and alternative energy. But I'm trained as an environmental engineer. So how do these things fit together? It seems like a, a dissonance. And I, I really think by the end of the presentation, you'll, you'll see how those two things are connected, that really when we think about sustainable agriculture and how this whole system works together, that really thinking about it from an environmental perspective is a good thing. And thinking about the energy and how we can grow biomass uh, is important. But let's let's dig into, this goes back to that project drawdown website that Laura brought in at the very beginning when she was sharing her screen. We have all of these different solutions to help with drawdown. And I would argue that farming plays a large part in many of them. And, you know, there's the obvious one, the one that we're focusing on today, but as you go through the rest of your series, I'd encourage you to think about the ways that farming and, and Pennsylvania farming can affect the other areas. So for example, electricity, when we think about that, we often worry about biomass and can we burn things other than wood and wood, which is a renewable resource for energy and electricity. Another thing, if we're going to talk about growing energy, you can't forget about ethanol and transportation. So we know corn is a good source of ethanol, but there's a lot of research happening to use other sources like uh, renewable grasses, so perennial grasses that come back each year that you can convert just like you would corn. It's a little harder. There's an extra step in there, but it this is not competing. It can often grow on land that is used for nothing else. But two that maybe you aren't thinking of that'll be later in your series are land sinks and engineered sinks. So a land sink, when you think of a place to store carbon, farms are a great place to start. We've got a lot of area that by changing management practices, they can act as sinks. We can grow these perennial crops. And even when we talk about engineered sinks, the big one that pops up is biochar, which is like a charcoal from burned down biomass. So it could be wood, but it also could be things left behind like corn stover, what's left behind after you take all the corn crop off a field. So as you step through it, remember farming's important. 
And I'm going to zoom in now to the topic at hand. So we've got this food and agriculture and land use. And if you were to click on this on that website, it leads you to a number of solutions. But let's talk about what it looks like in Pennsylvania. So farming is absolutely an important industry for us. So this is from the Pennsylvania uh, Department of Economic Development. We have six key industries and number three on the list is agribusiness. To drive that point home a little further, here's some numbers associated with it. So this is from the 2021 report for food manufacturing, $22 billion, and goes down from there. But forestry, animal processing, crop processing, these are big numbers that are bringing in economic value to Pennsylvania. And outside of that, from the same report, there's a number of farms here. We have over 50,000 farms, many acres, millions of acres, and overall a very productive system. So when we relate it back to Project Drawdown, there's a number of solutions and, and some of them work better in Pennsylvania than others. You know, some of the things here, systems of rice intensification isn't something that we can consider. But I wanted to start with one that I work with quite a bit, and that's conservation agriculture. I'm going to talk about what that means and ways that we're doing it here in Pennsylvania and at Penn State. So I use these terms sometimes interchangeably. When I think of conservation agriculture, I think of sustainable agriculture. It's a growing area of interest. Another buzzword you hear often, it goes a little step further is regenerative agriculture. So if conservation, you're conserving energy, conserving carbon, uh, regenerative goes a step further. So it involves these five things minimizing soil disturbance, so keeping the soil where it should be on the ground instead of churning it up, adding diversity, keeping things covered, all of these things. And the goal is three big outcomes. You want to improve the soil health. That's super important for Project Drawdown. You want to conserve your carbon. You want to foster biodiversity because that's ultimately helping the planet and creates these new ecosystems and value chain paths that we can make money from even. And the third one, coming back to money. So I work for Extension. Everything that I do goes directly to stakeholders. So one thing we have to talk about is how do we promote this economic resilience? How do we convince folks to take a chance on some of these practices that sometimes involve an initial sum of money and a lot of the time that's showing them what's the payback period? What's the, what's the amount of time until you see your money back or how might you be more resilient? Maybe having a few avenues to make money uh, before they put in any of the practices we talk about. So here's a couple of examples for you that we do a lot of here in Pennsylvania. One is no-till. So the image on the right, you see stocks lying down and they've tilled directly into the soybean crop into that without disturbing any of the soil. And on the opposite side, you're seeing no till, but also a cover crop added in. So clover added to keep the root structure growing even during the off season, during those cold months. And it provides another avenue for, for revenue for your farmers. But let's put numbers on it because it always helps me to see what this looks like from a cost perspective. So one of the things when we talk about conservation agriculture and conservation tillage is all these benefits, many of which are important to the ideas of project drawdown or climate science. But let's focus on this last one, reduce fuel consumption. Reduce fuel consumption, we're saving energy, we're using less of what's traditionally a fossil fuel on farms. But let's put some numbers on it. We've got two practices I want to highlight, a chisel plow and a no-till planter. So your chisel plow, so that's digging into the soil, tearing it up, and ultimately exposing that carbon to the atmosphere. That uses about a gallon of diesel per acre. Whereas if you just use your no-till planner, you're only using 0.35 gallons per acre. Imagine this on a 100-acre farm, which is a relatively small size for at least State College, Pennsylvania. And let's see how much 
diesel energy they use. If we put some numbers on this, that 110 gallons and the 35 gallons they used for the 100 acres, this is the June number two diesel cost. The numbers end up being significant just for these practices. So looking at spending $300, $370 versus 118, that's a 68% savings. So not only are you using quite a bit less fuel, you're saving money. And this is part of the way that I like to explain the importance of these practices. They have to go to have folks use them daily. We need to show this side as well. Okay. Another example for you and something that's near and dear to my heart is when we talk about regenerative systems and climate smart landscapes. So what does this mean? It's something like this, taking a farm where you might have the crops go right up to the water. This causes lots of problems. You have nutrient loss, you have soil loss. This creek can be in danger from terrible nutrient loading and that might go to a bigger stream. So we like to take environments like this and make them look like this. Here you can't barely even see the stream. It's hidden on the opposite side of this tall grass. This is a switchgrass plot and it's a perennial grass. So it comes back year after year. It adds stabilization. It keeps the nutrients more where they should be on the banks. And then you can plant your crops in as you go to the left of this photo. So how are we doing this? Whoops, I skipped ahead. We have got this project called Sea Change and it's a multi-institutional project. And, and this was, Laura said I did stuff with biogas. This is how that relates in. So we are doing this five year long project that asks farmers to, to integrate some switchgrass, to grow this perennial grass in areas like on streams or very steep slopes that nothing else grows. And think about the ways that that could enhance the ecology of the farm. But we have this idea that if you're going to create energy from biogas, we always need more feedstock, more things to feed it, not just manure, which is our standard stock, but adding in some of these grasses that are providing good things for the environment, but also giving us energy. So ultimately the idea is you take your grasses and you add it to a digester. This project, if it's something that's interesting to you, we do have a digester day coming up in July and you can see a state of the art digester. It would be a drive, a little bit of a long drive for you out to State College, Pennsylvania, but we just put in a state of the art um, digester that we're giving a tour of and having a whole day of education on it. Okay, so if we're thinking about these solutions, I would argue that a lot of them are in connect connection. So conservation agriculture directly ties to nutrient management. So if you're doing the things you say you should be doing for conservation, no-till, cover crops, you're often worried about nutrient management. Similarly, regenerative annual cropping, that's making sure you always have a crop in the ground. You're doing, that falls, I think, under the bigger umbrella of conservation ag. But one we didn't talk about is irrigation inefficiency. Excuse me, I'm going to cough. <coughs> so the idea is we can replace high pressure systems with more precise technology. So a traditional system might look like this. You pump water from a pond long distances out to a field and it sprays everywhere. You're broadcasting it. This takes a lot of energy and it loses a lot of water. It tends to be pretty inaccurate. But one of the things we can do that saves 70 to 90% of energy is use a lower pressure system. The diagram on the top shows you may have seen this if you've ever driven out, if you're near Lancaster, we've got these linear tubes. Sometimes you'll see a big spray, but more frequently now you see something that looks like the picture on the bottom. It's more of a mist. So it's much lower pressure, far more precise. You might even see something like the one all the way on the right where it's a drip line, absolutely precise. The most energy efficient version is this drip irrigation systems. 
So here you're getting right close to the root and saving a, as much water as you possibly can by giving the water directly where it's needed. <clears throat> so here's an example, because I always like to ground it in the numbers. If you just have a five acre plot of sweet corn. So I'm ready for sweet corn. It's that time of year where things are getting warmer and I'm ready for an ear of sweet corn. Let's see the difference between the two irrigation systems. So your high pressure system, so it's that big sprinkler throwing a bunch of water. It's about 60 PSI, so a high pressure system. And it costs you about $44 an acre. If you compare that to a drip system, same acreage, but this is only 10 PSI, much lower energy. You need a smaller pump. You don't need it to push as hard as fast. It's only $10 an acre. So your savings is about 76%. These are the types of things when we talk about project drawdown working in Pennsylvania, this is an easy one that we can point farmers to. Increasing irrigation efficiency close to 80%. That's a big number. So how are we doing this? Similarly, at Penn State, how are we making this work? And for us, it's our Energy Answers project. So I manage a project called Farm Energy Answers. And in that, it's a multi-institutional team. We have money from the USDA, and we create videos that answer common energy questions. And most of them relate to project drawdown solutions. It's a YouTube page where each question relates back to an energy answer. And here's a couple of examples of our titles. So anything from choosing maybe a, a heating fuel that relies less on fossil fuels, you might want to lower your electrical charges. So understanding your energy usage to, to save money, it could be anything like finding funding to do these projects or putting in a hydroponic system. All of these relate back to the ideas of Project Drawdown, and we create materials that can be used and, and distilled down to a general audience. It's just a screenshot of our most recent videos that are coming up, and um, we're starting to grow. So in returning to this, as I finish up, we've got all these solutions, and some of them work better in Pennsylvania than others, but I don't want you to forget, if you leave with anything from this, that farming doesn't just exist in the vacuum that is this tiny cell. Rather, farming is a big part, especially in Pennsylvania, of many of these industries, and it's, it's worth considering as you move through your series. So I think I'm just at time. So if you've got questions, feel free to take down my, my alias email, which is farmenergy at psu.edu. Thank you. And Siobhan, thank you so much for that, too. Uh, both your presentations uh, are incredible. And so again, uh, we're getting close to the Q&A time. So if people want to put questions in the chat, they can. But what I'd like to do is at least have a discussion uh, between the panelists. And I did this last time, and I think it worked pretty well. I know I have served on a number of panels myself at conferences. And sometimes I have questions I want to ask the other panelists, and I never had that opportunity. So for Alex and Javon, do you have questions you would like to ask each other? I'd like to give you the opportunity to, to kick it off if you would like. I could start. I've got one. So I, you breezed over it fast, but I've always been interested in the rice patties in Bangladesh. And you talked about the change in the planted area. When I think of this area, it, it's a climate sensitive area where we're not entirely sure if sea level rises, what will happen. Does that impact anything in your study? So when you think about that planted area, do you worry about effects with a worse monsoon or sea level rise? Does that come into play? Uh, yes. So there are different issues. So in Bangladesh, for instance, they have two to three growing season. And depending on how fast the second growing season is, they can do a third growing season. So with climate change and change in temperature and probably precipitation, we don't know what will happen to the third growing season. Uh, for the analysis itself, one major challenge to map rice paddies, which is useful for uh, food production, but also for methane emission estimation, so they produce a lot of methane, 
Uh, one main issue is that during the monsoon season, we have a lot of flooding. So it's not easy to differentiate a pixel between this is a rise and this is just a flooded area. So we are using different satellite products to be able to find also a response in uh, vegetation uh, indices and DVI, EVI to try to confirm it's actually a rice area. But uh, for climate change, yes, the major issue is if you have a delay of the planting season, you might not be able to uh, finish all of them on time and do a third one. I also know that in some area they are using wheat at the same time as uh, rice. Uh, they are cultivating both together. And when you do this, it's not the optimal uh, growing season for wheat. So if you delay it further, you will have an even less, like a lower yield for wheat production uh, in this area as well. Thank you. You're welcome. Alex, do you have a question for Siobhan? Yeah, actually, I was interested with the irrigation system. So in California, they have a lot of nuts uh, and they use all this uh, drip technology, which is uh, because they don't have any water. Uh, so my question is, at which point do you think we should use more efficient irrigation system or just not grow food in this area anymore and move to um, maybe northern latitude? I think that's a good question, but it's very hard to move infrastructure. So ultimately, it's not just the fields you have to worry about from my perspective. It's the, the communities and the infrastructure around it that you would have to balance. I do think, I think to a certain extent, we can prolong that time by having better irrigation or switching to foods that require less water, like not eating so many avocados, for example, that are high in water usage. And by changing, one of the things on there is changing your diet habits, but some of that might be in ways that you don't consider, like eating a, eating less corn in some areas, for example, is a good one too, because that is a, a water intensive crop. So paying more attention, but I'm not sure what the threshold is. I, I think the economists would have to deal with that, but also I think there's a a social factor there that you can't forget that it's very hard to move a community, whether the climate says it's ready to move or not. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> so I'd like to ask a question of both of you, which struck me very early on in both of your presentations. And, and myself is trained as a scientist and I know you're trained in science and engineering, but so much of your work involves economics and understanding trade and policy. And, and I'm just curious how you, uh, how you became engaged in that area. I, mean, I, I think sometimes as scientists, we think, well, I do the science part and someone else thinks about the other part and someone thinks about that other part. But so much of our work now, we need to get out of that silo and really think about these other parts. Alex, so much of what you presented um, and your own work, I don't think you could talk about it without talking about trade and economics, right? So where did you, where did you get schooled in that? And how have you been able to, uh, to really make those linkages work for you? Yeah, that's a good question. So. First of all, in France, we do a little bit of everything in engineering school, uh, finance, economy, management. So I have a good background in uh, economy and finance. And for my own uh, work, I saw that looking just at uh, the science design on the crop is not enough for me. I wanted to do something more useful to see the impact, <coughs> sorry, from the farm to the people consuming the food. And whenever you, you want to link uh, different, this item from production in USA to food consumption, let's say in Venezuela, you need to have some knowledge of uh, trade. There are many trade models that exist um, currently uh, for price modeling, et cetera. Some food prices happen without any change in food production. It's just some speculation that create a food crisis with the same uh, amount of food available. So it's something extremely interesting to look at. And Siobhan, almost the same question for you, but I, I think another trick you've had to add to your kit, if you will, is communication. You know, speaking with the farming community, knowing that language. And I know just recently I went through a, a beautiful drive through Lancaster, which a number of the farms are in the Amish community who are not watching YouTube videos and such. And so how do you communicate best practices 
to farmers, those that have the technology and also those in Pennsylvania that don't? Yeah, I think so as far as having to deal with all sides, I think all of us are becoming more more easily shifting between the, the silos of our interest. You can't just live in one area. We have to think about the other parts. And for me, science communication with these folks, I try to relate it to how could this impact your farm, the environment, and importantly, your bank account. And I think for me, I have to always ground it in, in the economics. But that being said, I would say most farmers are the best stewards of the land you'll find because they work on it every day. So sometimes there's a misunderstanding in what's, what's a good practice. But generally, if they find their yields are higher, that they're saving money, that they might be helping the environment in some way, they tend to be the first ones to adopt. It's when they get burned more than once by trying this new trend that the folks from Penn State have put out there that it ends up being a little iffy. But our farmers generally are our game to try new things. It's amazing how money can drive that conversation sometimes, the saving of money, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> we did have a couple of questions that came in on the registration forms for people that signed up for this evening. So I do wanna ask one of the questions here, how can we manage issues of overuse and extensive fertilization? If either of you would like to take that one start with that. A lot of the things we talked about today would help with that. So over fertilization, the first thing that we say is a nutrient management plan, which we haven't talked about, but that's applying nutrients at the right time and in the right amount. So you wouldn't apply nutrients at the very start of your rainy season when they would get washed away. You wait until the plant needs it, for example. Uh, another thing that you could do is the things we looked at. You have cover crops, you do no-till because you're keeping the soil where it's at, it doesn't get a chance to be turned over and all the nutrients wash away or you have to keep applying so that the, the roots have something to, to hold on to. So most of those things are conservation practices will be nutrient management practices for the most part. Great. And Siobhan, you, there's a question for you in the chat also. I see Alex got his question ahead. How many of these solutions are limited to wealthier nations? Alex, I think this also may apply to you as well. Uh, that have the resources to implement them. How many are also appropriate for um, those that are not as wealthy? I could take a stab at it, but Alex might have more well-rounded knowledge in this. I would say things that we've seen, some things you're right, it would be difficult to apply, but Generally, the idea of planting a cover crop is spreading to all different nations. And the, the idea of no-till or conservation tillage is something that ends up being cheaper for other nations. You don't require a specialized machinery. You can stick with one instead of the, the three plows that you would have used before. But you're right, there are limitations, but there are different things that other countries are doing that keeps them naturally more sustainable because they don't have the means to overextend themselves and have these mega farms that you see in in the midwest but alex you might have more things to add to that yeah it's true that uh some countries with less access to maybe the new technology from the 1890s don't have uh have this practice and can grow some more resilient some crop more resilient to extreme condition like for instance uh, droughts I know in Western Africa, they use a lot of millet instead of wheat, which is much more drought resistant, and they're more resilient to uh, drought in their own area. But on the other hand, um, even if food is a regulated, has a regulated price, a uh, wealthier nation can produce more food, always more and more food, and then export it, and uh, other countries will not be able to invest to have maybe better practice and also uh, sell their crops at a very low price. So they will not have the resources, enough resources to be able to invest in um, this new practice. So it impacts the whole system. <laughs> yes. So we do have a question too. Um, Project Drawdown calls for reduction to CO2 in the atmosphere while crops need CO2 and grow faster. The higher the concentration of CO2, how do you reconcile this? What, what is Project Drawdown's target concentration of atmospheric CO2? 
So actually, there was a study showing that uh, CO2 will make also the food less nutritious. So maybe you will increase the quantity of the food produced, but you will decrease some of the nutritional value of it. Uh, for instance, for wheat, if you have a higher yield, you might get uh, a lower protein content. And with, it depends on the type of plant, you have C3 and C4 photosynthesis, different crop will be affected differently. But uh, we should not think that higher CO2 is a good news uh, for food security, because if you change the nutritional value, you might have some people with some deficiency in uh, different vitamins or other micronutrients. To add to the second part of that question, I the what's the target concentration? I think more for project drawdown in my mind is that we go beyond lowering to zero CO2, but we also take a step towards sequestering CO2. So doing things like carbon capture and taking current carbon out of the atmosphere. So it's not so much as just reducing the, the level that we're outputting, but also capturing enough that we're going into negative levels on an annual basis. So some of the solutions there are things like biochar. So having something that can grab onto carbon and hold it so that it isn't escaping back into the atmosphere. So it, it's not just lowering the level, but actually sequestering it to take it away. Yeah, that grid that you showed, um, and that I also showed at the beginning. So the the early sectors that draw down lists are the sources, and then those last three, the coastal and ocean sinks, land sinks, and engineering sinks, are the ones um, that are that are trying to to move in that direction. That trying to from the sequestration and, and the removal and such. So. Uh, and, and they admit on the Drawdown website, there's still a lot more work that needs to be done in this area. Uh, if you click on engineering sinks, biochar is actually the only solution listed there. There is so much research that still needs to be done uh, and hopefully will be done <laughs> soon. Uh, we have another question in the chat. How can we get factory farms to change their practices to be more environmentally friendly? Oh, well, it helps if there's government incentives for that. Uh, incentives are always good. But I do think that um, cultures are changing. So you may have noticed that big companies like Amazon has a goal for being carbon neutral by 2040. When we see those societal pressures, it, it makes it easier to see it on farm. There's already the what we saw in Pennsylvania, for example, we saw a growth in small farms and a loss in the medium sized ones. We have a growth in small farms because folks are interested in buying local, buying products that they know were made by farmer A with his wife on their dairy farm. These products are becoming more important. So I, I think if we keep pushing this small, eat small, eat local, it helps. But unfortunately we cannot feed everyone if we don't have some factory farms. So some of it is changing our practices. If we, if we truly want less factory farms, we have to eat less meat. We have to cut back on certain things. And unfortunately to, to meet demands to feed people that they, they can't go away entirely, but we can ask them to change some of their practices to be more environmentally friendly. No, I agree. And in addition to this, uh, if we look at the trade flow between countries, there is a lot of exportation of cereals from US to New Zealand, and then some lamb is exported back from New Zealand to, to USA. So all this uh, transportation has also some carbon footprints. And if we switch to our more local production, um, of course, there are some restrictions because we need a lot of land to produce food. So we cannot have a local consumption all the time, but if we switch to our more local, consumption, we can have a more environmentally friendly food produced. Do you both think that maybe one of our challenges is that there's a lot of people that don't know where their food comes from? And maybe if we did better educating what the food is, what the components are, you mentioned cereal, Alex, and I'm thinking like a box of Captain Crunch or something, right? Like what's actually in there? Where did those ingredients come from? Never mind the nutritional value, but <laughs> uh, the coffee that I know my students are getting at Starbucks every morning, I know they're not thinking twice about what is that supply chain, 
right? What has been the impact of where that coffee has come from? Now, again, that's not going to be a Pennsylvania product. That's not a continental United States product either. But maybe we need to do a better job just educating about food systems in general. Um, and maybe that would help us go a long way towards um, reducing those CO2 emissions. Those are my thoughts. Yes, I mean, it would be great if you have uh, maybe some indicator of uh, the supply chain for the food. If you buy some land, you know where it was produced, uh, you know where it comes from, if you buy whatever food product it is. Uh, I know in Europe, they try to have some of these indices uh, for different type of commodities, so people have a better idea of where is it produced, uh, especially in Europe, usually we have some patent for the food. If you buy a cheese, it comes, you can only give the name if you come from a specific region. So it's a little bit, little bit easier to trace uh, the food. And also with blockchain technology, they try to uh, follow the full supply chain of the food. Uh, I know they, there was some uh, project to be able to fight illegal fishing. Uh, so if you are able to track all the fish, where it comes from, you can uh, sometimes you will be able to know if some fish were uh, harvested in a protected area, which is illegal, obviously. So there will be some technology to help to be able to trace the food. Uh, one major, major challenge that is really complex, food is moving a lot, is processed a lot sometimes. And when you buy one food product, you have a lot of different elements that might be uh, processed in different factories in different countries and produced in different countries as well. So it's really, complicated to be able to trace uh, the full food product, but uh, that's something I think we'll go towards. I tend to agree with Laura that some of the, in addition to the things that Alex said, I, I which are all great ideas, I'd love to see implemented more than just the shop local signs. But we have had really good success with certain outreach. In, in our area, like the Chesapeake Bay Foundation, education. Our, most of our students that go through school have some idea about water nutrients and keeping water safe and healthy. And those things did not exist 25 years ago, 30 years ago. We've made that a part of curriculum. So if we can infuse it in multiple ways, we have a better chance of success. And if I can take a quick detour here, I want to share my screen in terms of multiple ways of having success. One of the things we've been encouraging our webinar participants to think about is participating in the Drawdown Eco Challenge, again, which is very easy steps that each of us as individuals can take uh, to make a difference on our impact on the environment. And the Eco Challenge is divided up uh, and aligns with each of the Drawdown sectors. So I'm showing you the page for food, agriculture, and land use. And I'm just gonna scroll down for some of them. There's a lot that you could do within here. And again, you can sign up and join the Drawdown DCIS Eco Challenge team or on your own, just taking a look at some of these. Again, supporting local food systems, we've talked about reducing animal products, uh, learning the truth about expiration dates. I think that's interesting, which certainly does tie into uh, reducing food waste as well. Smaller portions, there is a lot that is on here that you can read about. And I'm gonna go ahead and I'm just gonna grab this link and I'll put it in the chat for everyone. Uh, it is on our website as well, but if you wanna take a look at that and see again, what are some of the individual actions that each of you can take uh, in, in terms of the food, land use and agriculture sector, even if you don't have a farm, there's still, uh, behaviors that we can do. So Siobhan and Alex, do you have any last words you would like to say as we're getting towards the end of our hour here? Any kind of take home messages for uh, everyone that's watching? I can go first. I, I think uh, I think Laura said it nicely that you don't have to be a farmer to change things in this sector. And I would absolutely agree to that. There's plenty of things that you can motivate either by policy or changing your buying habits or supporting local organizations that you can make an impact outside of the conservation tillage things I talked about that you might not have a chance to impact in any way. But there's a bunch of habits you can change that will make a, a measurable difference. Yeah, I agree with this. Uh, as a consumer, you can change a lot of things. And sometimes it might be very difficult. Uh, if you want to know the carbon, carbon footprint of one product, it's really difficult to know it. 
but this should be some policy change and you can always contact your representative to show some interest in having uh, more control on, for example, the food produce, the processed food, the carbon footprint on it. And if enough people contact them, uh, eventually they will be interested to uh, work on some bills. Thank you both so much for your time this evening. And I'm also going to put in the chat the link for our uh, next lecture that is happening at the end of June, the last Thursday of June, uh, focusing uh, industry does not sound like a very attractive term, but we are going to be learning about biological plastics recycling, so bioplastics, and also about anaerobic digesters and how we can reuse waste to make sure we don't make more waste. And so uh, again, two speakers next month that I, that I think everyone will really enjoy. So I wanna thank both of our panelists this evening for joining us. 